You were talking, you know, the old said about the, the dispensary. Everyone in Cork used to have to go down to the dispensary. Sure, everyone I asked about doctors' names and everything, there, was a, there seemed to be only one doctor there. And that was Dr. Um, Cagney, Dr. Cagney. He, he must have been everyone's doctor, like. He was a doctor for everything, really. And all you go, you go into him now, you're going to be a, a bottle of coloured water. <laughs> no one knew what was in the water, like. But it was all, um, all medicine in bottles. And lo and behold, if you went without your bottle, you'd have to go across the road into Mr. Gamble, who was the tinsmith there in, um, in Bratton Street. That was another um, shop in, in Bratton Street. I think there was about three tinsmiths there. Do you remember anything about the, the building inside? Well, I, I do. You, you kind of went through, if you want to be better, well, no, I'd call it a gate, and then you were kind of inside in the yard, and there were steps going up to it. And there was a woman, a grey-haired woman, on the left-hand side, and um, we went in there and it was all bench seats like you, like you see in a church now. And there was little hatches and you kind of queued up and you, you go up to the doctor and then you go in and next you'd have to go over to the hatch and they'd, they'd hatch you up and you're one with hand out your battle stuff and off you went. <laughs> Just gas. I didn't realise that we were going for the TB injections. We call them after the branding iron, because 55 years later I still have the scar on my arm, right? Because all of my mother brought me to a GP now, but this particular morning my father. The front entrance to the, the dispensary at that time was on Grattan Street. Beautiful building, as I said now, but there was such a crowd there, we were actually out in the street, with, I presume, 20 children in front of me, not realising there was another 60 or 80 in the building before me as well. So every child we seen coming out was either in a state of shock, eyes, mouth wide open, or they were screaming their freaking head out, right? And we were looking at this. There wasn't one came out smiling or... So, being the brave guy I am, every step closer I took, I was losing weight, right? <laughs> With fear. Because I still didn't know what was, what was ahead of me. Eventually we got in the front door, and every person, every child that came out of that room was like someone in a different planet right from the fear and the pain that i didn't realize the pain was so severe either next we were getting closer and closer and in with me anyway and i remember them i couldn't tell you which doctor was now but this thing came out and i thought it was like a branding iron for cattle it was, actually it was like a bolt about six inches long and it looked as if he loaded kind of cartridges into it. The needles and the needles fifty five years ago weren't as thin, believe me. These things look as thick as a refill of a boiro. And I think it was six or eight of them at the one whip. If you asked me my name I couldn't tell you. I was scared stiff. But I remember my father catching my left wrist and arm and really squeezing me tight. The GP told him don't let her move. And then all of a sudden there's this sudden shock of a thump went into your system like as if you electrocuted. But then it took another, well if it like an hour to me, it took about another 10 seconds for him to discharge the, the liquid. So coming out anyway, I, I really felt like, I was screaming as well the same as the next guy. It was, we, we, we could have made a record I'd say out of the 60 <laughs> children screaming at one time. You know, I came out of there and I went over, I remember the father bringing me for ice cream somewhere. And, um, God almighty, I, I tell you, I'll always remember it. And we were delighted a couple of years afterwards, not too long after now, we were told this thing was coming up again. So I'd have been probably 12-ish now at this stage. And I, I made my mind up at 12, ma'am, dad, I am not going there again. But actually, it was sugar lumps they gave us after. The sugar, when, when you were eating it, it was beautiful, but when it went down, it, when, it, when it decided to work on you, oh, there was a taste in your mouth for about three days after whatever was in it. But the Quakers was nice, yeah. which it's was a dairy place. Just big, huge, yeah. high ceilings. The garden then, like, were kind of at the... It was in a bit, and you were isolated. The big door was never open. 
the main door. The side door would be open, but they had the bell on the door and you could ring the bell, you know. And then it, it beyond that, then, of course, you had all the doctors, the dispensary then. You had all the doctors, and there were about eight doctors, about four on either side. It was like a big hall with rooms off of it. And you had benches outside of the uh, doctor. And you just went in and you queued up. No appointment. But every area then had their own doctor. We had Dr Cagney. But there was a Dr Morden there then, but he would be for another area. But that's how you got your medicine then on the way out from the chemist, a little hole in the wall. And if you wanted a cough bottle, you brought your own bottle. But I can't remember how you got tablets. It wouldn't surprise me if you got them in a the matchbox. We had Dr Cagney. He was abrupt, but a very good doctor. But he was fabulous. Very abrupt. You'd be afraid, like. <laughs> you wouldn't ask him questions. No. Oh, no, the glasses would be down. You know, and there was a medicine going at the time you now, it was more of a tonic. Parish's food, it was called. And you would do it, but you had to bring your own bottle. That time you now, like, to get medicine. You brought your bottle and you got the big bottle of Parish's food. Sure, listen, push me over the next day again for another bottle. It was a beau- Everyone loved Parish's food. Now, anyone that let me talk to you know about it, Parish's food. We loved it. <laughs> Oh yes, this was the time we, we, my mother says, oh no, not him again. And of course, not knowing what was going on, it was a guy called Kick the Bucket. He lived in the parish, but where, I don't know. If I had to have a good guess, he was Bachelor's Keyway, Glenville Place. And I remember him saying to the mother, oh yes, he was 22 years of age only, a young man. And, uh, but a man to me, do you know, he was still a man to me. I'm very sick. God, I'm down here again last week. I'm very sick. I am dying, you know. He says, it won't be long more and I'll be kicking the bucket. So you can imagine that's where his nickname came from because it was like a religion where every Monday morning he had a different Ill- illness. At the time we didn't know what a hypochondric was. But every Monday morning he'd back down and he'd, he'd pick somebody else and sit down next to them and it might have taken a year or two that everybody in the surgery knew kick the bucket. Because, what's wrong with you this morning? Oh, I'm dying. There's not long more left to me. I'll be kicking the bucket. Now, the same guy, as the years went by, my father, God rest him, said that, um, kick the bucket is after dying. At the right young age of 81. Right, yes, he lived till 81 afterwards. He buried all his friends. <laughs> and most of the GPs, well, the older GPs, right? So he was dying since 22, but he got away till 81. I'll always remember that. And it was a fire in Jennings. There's one thing, it's the biggest fire cork ever in the opera house. This, this news spread faster than that. Kick the buckers dead, kick the buckers dead. We were 61 years waiting for him to die or something, you know? But by God, I remember, kick, kick the buckers. Well, it's a community building. It's very of the community. It's a very... It has a sense of resilience to it. It's here and it's been here and it will be here. And it has a sense of service that it's always been a building that's been about providing something to people or for people. Um, you know, if it was a dog, it would be a Labrador. It would be an old smelly Labrador with bad teeth, <laughs> farts a lot, but it would be a Labrador, you know. One of those ones that's just a pet, even though it's really old and quite stinky. Yeah, it would be one of those um, and that everybody loves. And when, they, you know, when they're gone, everybody's devastated. Um, yeah, yeah. So it is very much a service building. It's about, and I, I suppose, I don't know what it would be in its next incarnation. I would hate to see it closed and empty. I think it would just lose the. There really is a sense of spirit in this place. It's. I mean, I know buildings are only brick and mortar and whatever, but there really is a sense in this place that its function is to serve. And, and if it can't do that, that it would, it would lose something of itself. A kind of a leveling effect. Um, Nobody thought they were above anyone and everybody had their strengths and weaknesses. And you might, might be weak at one thing, but either a colleague from your own discipline would help you along and vice versa. If somebody else was maybe struggling with something or wanted to share something, they could thrash it out. And then you met people from the other disciplines and you'd say, you know, what should I do with this or that? Or 
we were able to tick tack with one another and that was great and it was very personal rather than a big impersonal building and there you go beyond those double doors you're in somebody else's territory there was none of that mm -hmm. and the very fact that we had the big tea room as well at least we all melted together <laughs> there yeah. yeah how things have changed like you like the offices some of the offices are empty and yeah. it's just it's hard it's hard to see absolutely yeah I'd like me when it comes to Grattan Street my office over I've been in the office 18 and a half I, I, I think it was March I started it was March 2001 so I'm 18 years and like if the, them walls could talk my whole life story has been in the walls do you know what I mean I've been longer in here than I've probably been in my own home so I'm, I've, I'm very fond of the place and I suppose leaving it is very tough and it's very tough for a good few of us because we're kind of like the other part is obviously the, the registry office at the front is where people get married that, I don't know how long it's been doing that though I'm ashamed to say I have no idea um, but you do get weddings that's the other very extraordinary thing is you'll come in on a on a day to do your clinic and there'll be you know a, a very colourful exciting looking wedding out the front it's very lovely um, yeah and then you'll hear you know a baby crying downstairs for you know having a having a um, a check with the public health nurse you know a newborn and then you'll have a couple of you know very elderly people from the share houses across the way over for podiatry so you have this great kind of swathe of human life downstairs which is very lovely. The weddings are lovely. I mean, who doesn't love a wedding? It's like you could come in and be feeling desperately sorry for yourself and, you know, it's Monday and you this and you that and you come in and you see a lovely wedding and it's lovely. And they're, you know, they're such, I suppose, because it's such an urban landscape and it's all quite grey and quite drab, um, there's something very, um, I suppose you're used to seeing weddings maybe in, in different contexts. So you see these very, you know, dressed up, bright clothes, flowers, hair, high heels, you know, the whole lot. In this very kind of in your work environment, it's quite it's quite it does it is quite arresting, yeah, um, yeah, and everybody smiles. I don't think anyone doesn't smile when they see a wedding, you know, and they're always like so happy and yay, we're getting married, yay, you know, it's lovely, it's lovely. I miss that when we move. Actually, it's lovely. I suppose the Christmas party is something I can take a little bit of pride in, even though I shouldn't be saying it, but it kind of it kind of was there when I went there first, and when I came back, then it had kind of lapsed. And I said, what's happening? We don't have the Christmas party. So kind of, yeah, they said, yeah, we should have that, you know. So it's a kind of a meeting of minds, really. And it started again then. But I think that's, it's about the only time we've anything inside in Ratton Street. It lets you have a bit of fun. Pure fun. I mean, we talk, we just come in, we sit down, we talk, we try to get a bit of music in the background. We're all talking about our plans and about getting out of there and chilling and eating different bits and pieces. And um, we used to always rely on one of our team, I won't mention her name, to bring in a lovely um, few bottles of um, punch or something. And we'd have a little glass of that. But that all changed when she left. <laughs> and then with the driving, you couldn't. Yeah. But no, but the sense of fun really is the main thing for that, the Christmas party. Sense of fun. Now the waiting room is opened up. There are pillars and there's a balcony all around it. In my day, um, there was a timber floor. So you clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. And of course the room was up at the far end. And um, there would have been a ceiling on it. So it was enclosed and you had the, the echo of okay. that. And so the, that gallery wasn't there? Then. Oh no, no, no. And we didn't have access up there. I think there was a door up there, but we didn't go up there. It was kind of a, a dirty, cobwebby, haunted store place with pigeons flying around up there. No, we didn't go up there. <laughs> and stuff from the time the pharmacy or the chemists and all those people, well, according to end anyway, they were those things were stored up there. But I do remember this kind of hollow sound, and you clip clopping up through the waiting room and these old fashioned kind of metal chairs with a, a sort of a timber um, seat on them. And the, you'd have the queue in the morning then for the dressings um, and, you know, big legs facing older people with big swollen legs. Um. The thing about Grattan Street is it's got so many disciplines and people interact in a, in a kind of a friendship kind of a way. I'd imagine a bigger building, 
you know, different disciplines could be hived off into their own little sections and they wouldn't mix as much because there'd be so many of them. But like, if you have a building with 50 people and you have five from this discipline or four from this discipline or three from this discipline, they have to interact with each other. The place is big enough to have heart. I think if something becomes too big altogether, it becomes impersonal. So like it has spirit, it has heart, and there's, it, 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 you know. And also the building itself is 150 years old. And it was, it was an old Quaker meeting hall. So like, it's, it's not like it was a psychiatric institution or something. It has a happy, it has a happy story attached to the building. It's, it is a happy building. It, it, it was uh, a Quaker meeting hall, and the Quakers in the, in, were very, at the time, they were good to the people of Carter and the famine. You know, they had a soup kitchen running out of here, apparently.